Hello everyone, Noah Novels here, and welcome back to my Review Starlight episode discussion and analysis series. In today's video, we will be going over the seventh episode of the anime, titled after the blindingly bright stage girl herself, Nana Daiba. With that being said, let's begin talking about the episode. The episode begins by showing us a closer look at the previous year's performance of the play Starlight, where we get to see each of the main girl's lines in the production. One thing I really like about this scene is that each of the characters' lines do in some way reflect their struggles and character arcs that we've seen them go through. And Nana's line about repeating and the cycle of despair that is to be found below Starlight is no exception, as we're about to witness. As the play wraps up and everyone happily takes a bow, Nana says something that's going to become pretty relevant in the episode to come. It's so bright. What better scene to come after a line about how bright something is than a scene at night, which is what we get as the closing party for the 99th class's production of Starlight begins. As the happy celebration amongst theater students commences, Nana goes around taking pictures of everyone while talking about themselves in the production. Juno's already thinking about next year's performance, Karen praises Nana, Mihiru says she was able to get through the play thanks to Karen, Claudine makes it clear she has no intention to lose to Maya, and Maya says they should audition for the lead roles next year together, making it a point to say Nana should as well. We get a cute little interaction between Karuko and Futaba, who both thank Nana for her hard work and help, and they're far from the only ones who received help from Nana. As Mihiro and two other girls talk about how Nana helped out, and Karen says they were only able to make it through everything thanks to Nana making snacks for everyone, such as banana muffins. Karen then comes to the greatest realization in human history as she says Nana is like everyone's banana. She's sweet, kind, nourishing, and can even ease stiff shoulders if Karuko's satisfaction over her shoulder massage is any indication. Karuko adds on to this by saying even her height is banana-like, and just… what the hell do you mean by that? Embracing her newfound life as a banana, Nana starts crying tears of joy. As we get a shot of all the characters, Nana talks about how happy she is that she came to SciShow, and that she never thought performing would be so enjoyable. She promises to never forget the brightly shining stage that she was meant for, the stage of the 99th class's production of Starlight. And before the opening plays, Nana says it was this day that the stage girl, Nana Daiba, was born. After the opening, we see that it's spring vacation and that everyone is leaving the dorms at SciShow except Nana and Juna. These quick few wide shots of Nana standing with her phone in the empty rooms do such a great job at conveying the empty and lonely feeling that you can get after saying goodbye to your friends. Especially if they're friends that you've spent as much time with as Nana has with everyone who had just left. No longer are these bright and lively rooms filled with the sounds of everyone interacting, now they're just dull, empty spaces of silence. It's honestly kind of sad, but thankfully Nana isn't completely alone. The room shared between Nana and Juna feels so much brighter and happier compared to what we just saw thanks to both the bright colors of all the surroundings in the room, as well as the peaceful and wholesome vibe that Juna and Nana's relationship and interaction gives off. Juna asks Nana if she's staying at the SciShow dorms with her just because she's worried about her, but Nana gladly assures her that she wants to be there with her. We cut to the next school year where Nana is happily recording Juna getting ready for the first day of their next year at SciShow. And I just love how overly intense and serious Juna is about making a good first impression as an upperclassman. This proud look of hers when she puts on her glasses is priceless. Their first day of their second year starts off as happy and hopeful as the rest of the episode has mostly been up to this point, with Nana and Juna happily greeting the new students. After Nana eagerly greets everyone in the second year classroom, she notices that two classmates are missing, Naruse and Okasa. And the way the calm and happy piano music slowly fades out and is replaced with an ominous sound effect growing louder once she realizes this is very effective. And it serves as a great lead-in for the impactful moment where Juna announces that they likely dropped out. And so, the cracks begin to form on what was supposed to be another bright and memorable year. The next scene shows Juna sadly taking Naruse's name tag off her locker. 
saying that they have to move forward and make this year's performance even better than the last. But Juno's smile and optimism in this scene, it feels forced. Like she's trying to hide or brush past the sadness she's feeling now that two of her former classmates are missing from her life. And Nana's smile back to her feels the same way. There's also something else I really love about this scene that continues throughout the episode. After the close-up shot of the locker, when the scene cuts to a wider shot of Juna and Nana, one thing that immediately stood out to me was that the colors of the animation all felt so… dull. Almost as if the grey of the now-deserted locker has spread throughout all of the animation to give things this eerie, sad, and incomplete feeling. A feeling that is very in line with how the characters are feeling now, especially Nana as the episode progresses. If you look at the animation from earlier this episode or any of the previous episodes, typically the scenes feel very well lit with bright and vivid colors. Not just for the review auditions, but the show as a whole, at least I think so. So to have that familiar and almost comforting animation suddenly replaced with one that feels dim with washed out colors? Well, it's very effective in conveying the feelings of the characters. That, along with the back of any background music, does a great job of making me feel the levity of these two classmates suddenly being gone. Even though I personally didn't know these characters, everyone else did. And their departure hurts. The next scene is the commencement of auditions for the second performance of Starlight for the 100th Sideshow Festival. We get a really fun scene of Nana taking pictures of everyone, as all of our favorite stage girls are eager to audition and claim the lead roles for themselves. It's very nice to see through this scene with fitting and fun dialogue that by this point, Everyone seems to be happy again and have moved on from the sadness over their two classmates' departure. Sad as it may be, Losing connections with classmates is a pretty normal occurrence for people, so it's great to see that everyone seems to be doing okay, and are eager to move forward in pursuit of growing their theatrical skills and talent. However, this happy atmosphere is interrupted by Maya asking Nana if she can have a word with her. As the two talk outside in the next scene, the background music once again comes to a halt. As Nana and Maya walk outside, Nana begins happily talking about the auditions for this year's performance, as well as how vividly she remembers her beloved previous performance of Starlight, wondering if they can all have that same stage once more. Maya quickly shuts that idea down by saying that even if everyone from the first production is involved in this new one, it will not be the same performance. As she begins saying this, a beautiful but haunting piano track begins to play. Maya begins to berate Nana, reminding her of what she said at the celebration party earlier in the episode that they should both audition for the lead roles. Maya talks about how there are people who will never get the opportunity to land a lead role, no matter how hard they try. And she can't understand why someone with Nana's level of passion and talent for every aspect of theater, not just acting, refuses to pursue the lead role. Also real quickly, as Maya is talking about how some people will never become leads, we get to see some shots of various girls at SciShow going about their day. And, uh, that's kinda brutal, Revy Starlight. That's a hell of a way to call these girls out. But anyways, as Maya wonders why Nana refuses to audition for a lead role, all the previous girls from those shots turn to look toward the screen, almost as if they're all looking at Nana, just as Maya is now and wondering, why? The piano music cuts off at this moment too, and it does such a great job of displaying Maya's confusion and anger towards Nana for not trying to get a lead role. Really, the whole scene does this so well. The continued use of dull colors and lighting, the wide angles and shots making everything feel so desolate, the aforementioned piano music track and lack thereof when it stops, Maho Tomito's fantastic voice acting, it all comes together in a scene that feels like it represents both Nana and Maya in this scene. It feels empty and lonely, but underneath that feeling also lies something else. Something that I think is brought out very well with the piano track used. Resentment. Nana's despair over losing her precious stage and Maya's resentment towards her for not pursuing the lead roles both come together wonderfully in this tense and mesmerizing scene. Man, the directing in this episode is so top tier. I mean, it is for the whole series, but this episode, despite not having a review audition, manages to be just as ambitious with its storytelling and presentation as any other episode of this show. And that is amazing to me. Okay, geek out moment over. The scene ends with Maya telling Nana that if she's not making a serious effort because she wants to remain as everyone's support, or their banana, then she will never forgive her. With this parting remark, 
We cut to the next scene, which shows Nana outside fondly looking at her photos from the celebration party earlier in the episode. But this weak smile of Nana pretty clearly shows her growing sadness over the loss of her original starlight. This solemn atmosphere is slightly broken up, however, with the arrival of Juna, Karen, and Mahiru. They all start looking at Nana's photos together. And Juna says looking at them feels nostalgic, despite it only being two months ago. Nana goes on to say that she loves this starlight. And Juna and Karen share that same sentiment. Nana once again wonders if they'll never have that same performance again. One made by the combined effort, love, and passion of everyone in the 99th class. And <laughs> man, this scene gets to me. I know, shocker, Revue Starlight can make me emotional. But seriously, the music track that plays in the background, the shot of the group photo in Nana and Juna's room, and Moeka Kozumi's wistful delivery of Nana's lines in this moment, it all comes together for a moment that is equal parts happy and sorrowful. It feels happy because we're remembering all the good times with Nana, but that just makes the scene that much more melancholic because we know that Nana won't ever get that stage back. Or will she? Anyways, another thing I want to point out about this scene that I really like is how it manages to convey this feeling of detachment and loneliness through its use of wider shots and angles. Now this is not the only scene in the episode to have wide shots, obviously. I was just talking about them in the scene beforehand with Maya and Nana. But it's such a stark contrast to the closer and more crowded shots of the celebration party from two months ago. While said party did have some wide shots, a lot of the shots were closer up and featured many characters crammed into the frame, and it worked very well for this. After all, it was a party celebrating a successful stage production that a lot of people had a part in. You really felt the close friendships and camaraderie between everyone as we watched Nana go throughout the party and take pictures. And for me, it brought back the crushing terror I feel whenever I'm in a crowded party and oh my who do I talk to and oh no am I standing in someone's way and uh, I'm gonna stand in a corner by myself, okay bye! And even the wider shots in the scene still felt very inviting and energetic thanks to the colors still being bright like usual as well as the music and actual contents of the scenes taking place during the party. And I'll compare this to the angles and shot composition of the scene we're currently watching. The closest we get to a character is a medium close-up, I'd say, particularly the shot of Nana at the beginning. And the shot composition is just jarring. A lot of the characters are placed unnaturally close to the sides and corners of the frame, leaving all this blank space beside or above them and making them feel so small and distant. They even cross the 180 degree line for the last shot of Nana with another character and it's so jarring and used to great effect and it makes the scene feel so… wrong. Even though in concept this should be a happy scene, four good friends who all love theater are reminiscing about a production that they did a great job on. And Karen starts talking about how they have to keep practicing to have even better performances going forward. Even if everyone from before isn't there and the stage is different because of it. I mean, this should be an inspiring and joyful scene. Any scene with Karen is, dain it. But even though Karen, Juna, and Mahiru seem able to look back on their past production of Starlight with fond memories, even though they have gotten over the sadness of Narose and Okusa's departure, even though they're all looking forward to bettering themselves and putting on an even better production of Starlight, even though the dialogue and banter between them all is also friendly and comfortable and inspiring, there's one among them that feels different. And this is her episode, and we're seeing things through her perspective. To Nana, this cheerful reminiscing about the previous production of Starlight serves as a painful reminder of what she's lost and can never get back. And that's why, despite the cheerful energy the conversation around her exudes, she doesn't say a word after her lines about never having the same performance again. And the last shot of her with another character in this scene shows her blankly looking up at the sky, as detached and lifeless as the shots in this scene have been. It's chilling and genuinely amazing how a scene can be equal parts heartwarming and soul-crushing. The use of jarring angles and shot composition, the music in the background, the fantastic voice acting, it all makes this scene feel equal parts nostalgic and hopeless at the same time. And if that doesn't describe how Nana herself is feeling right now, I don't know what would. After a shot of the sky while Karen and Juna continue to talk, we get a really smooth transition to the next scene. We see an extreme close-up of Nana's vacant gaze towards the sky before she blinks and we cut to her lying around by herself later in the night. Nana briefly entertains the idea of following the chance of an even greater stage, but one look at the group photo on her phone is all it takes to convince her that the performance of Starlight from two months ago is the brightest stage she'll ever know. And I know I already mentioned her voice acting earlier, but Nana's voice actress, Moeka Kozumi, 
does such a wonderful job with these lines, and all her lines for that matter. The heartbreak you can hear in Nana's voice, not just in this scene, but the scene prior, is just so painful and evocative, and we'll come to eventually see how amazing of a singer she is as well. Also, this isn't important at all, but while typing the script I paused on the shot of the group photo and after glancing at it for a few minutes while doing some other stuff on my phone, I can't help but notice that Karuko looks like she's going in to eat Futaba. Like, I know she's just smiling and her eyes are closed, but I don't know. Maybe this is what being sleep deprived while working on these scripts does to me. Before Nana can worry too much for Futaba's safety, however, her phone cuts to something we're all familiar with, while an also familiar notification sound begins to play. After commenting on how cute the giraffe logo is, the next scene sees Nana being overwhelmed by bright yellow stage lights in the underground theater, and naturally, the giraffe is there as well. This scene feels so surreal. It takes the underground theater area we've all come to know throughout the series and gives it this ominous presence. The blinding yellow lights illuminating the stage the giraffe and Nana are on, but keeping everything around shrouded in darkness. The giraffe's overwhelming presence, both physically within the shots and his voice actor's delivery, and the mesmerizing music. It all exudes the same graceful beauty that this area has had in the show up to this point, but it also contains something sinister lurking underneath. The giraffe asks Nana if she finds it blinding before going on to talk about the nature of the ray views, that the more shine that a stage girl feels, the more alive the stage becomes. As he talks about the lighting equipment, sound devices, and stage equipment, we see all of these things lying still in the darkness, with no shine there to currently power them. The giraffe goes on to say that the one who presents the most dazzling of ray views shall find the path to becoming the top star, the one who stands atop the stage of fate. As we see a tiara that shines so bright that it looks like a star from a distance, the giraffe continues to passionately talk about the top star and how her brilliant talent will become a lead role that lasts for all of eternity. As the music swells while the giraffe continues talking, his passionate monologue is interrupted by Nana saying she doesn't care. After all, there will never be a stage as brilliant and beautiful as the stage of her production of Starlight. Not even the stage of fate that the top star gets to stand upon. The giraffe, seemingly already aware of this, asks her, What if you could stand upon any stage that you desired? The giraffe continues speaking. He knows that Nana has already experienced the most blinding of stages, but one that she can never have again. At least, not on her own. He once again asks Nana if it is blinding. In this moment, is he talking about the shine of the top star's tiara, or the shine of Nana's performance of Starlight? Who's to say? Nana asks for confirmation that she can truly stand on any stage, no matter when or what kind, showing for the first time in a long time in the episode genuine care and interest. The music for this scene is so good too. It starts off more slow and ominous while still feeling elegant and beautiful, which is very fitting for Nana's first interaction with the giraffe in the underground theater. The music swells as the giraffe talks about the top star, only to momentarily slow down when Nana interrupts with her disinterest. But as the giraffe begins to help her realize she can get her beloved stage back, the music once again picks up, this time even more intense than before. This girl who felt like she had lost the most precious time in her life is starting to realize she can get it back, and she wants it back desperately, and you can hear that in the music. It feels beautiful and frantic. And what better combination of words is there to describe a stage girl on a desperate mission to get back what she lost? How this music, along with other things like the actual writing and the shot composition, managed to make this scene just as memorable and impactful as any review is something truly special. The giraffe asks Nana if she will participate in the review auditions, and while she doesn't actually say yes, I think one look at her face is enough to make both the giraffe and we the viewers understand her answer to his question. As the music continues, we cut to the end of a review battle between Maya and Nana, with Maya having just lost. Maya struggles to understand what happened to Nana to cause such a change, but Nana, same as the giraffe, just asks if it is blinding. As Nana continues to talk about how she is blinding and how she can't reach it in front of the yellow stage lights like the giraffe was when he was talking to her in the scene beforehand, the curtains begin to close. And before Maya can confront Nana further, the curtain cuts her off and Nana makes her position zero decree. Nana, the victor of the review auditions, is once again confronted by the giraffe. After congratulating her, the giraffe asks what is the stage that Nana wishes for now that she is the top star. Nana, surprising no one at this point, wishes for a repeat performance of Starlight at the 99th SciShow Festival. The brilliant shine of the day spent between her and her classmates making that production she wants that blinding and beautiful stage once more, and in the most unceremonious way possible, 
The tiara of the top star that shined with such intensity earlier is cast down at Nana's feet after the giraffe agrees to her request, right above the Position Zero logo. Honestly, I love how subdued and quiet this whole scene is. What should be this grand and epic occasion, the top star receiving the tiara and the ability to stand upon any stage she wishes for. It feels so empty, and that makes sense, as it all means nothing to Nana. She doesn't care about being the top star. She doesn't care about the beautiful tiara. She doesn't care about how Shine makes the reviews come to life or what the stage of fate is even supposed to mean. The only thing she cares about is getting her performance of Starlight back. These review auditions that she went through mostly off screen and receiving the title of top star? It was all a means to an end. That's why there's no grandiose music like when she first learned about how the top star can give her any stage she wants. Why she acts so detached and sounds so lifeless for the most part when she talks. None of this matters. What does matter is what comes next. We close in on the tiara as a mechanical buzzing sound begins, and the screen fades to black with only the shine of the red jewel on the tiara remaining. The shining jewel becoming accompanied by two other red lights, not unlike the stars in Starlight itself, before their combined shining light takes over the screen and we transition to Nana back in a SciShow classroom. A classroom where a teacher announces that the 99th class will be performing Starlight. We see everyone's excited reaction to the news of performing Starlight, and Nana, in her confusion, asks Juna what's going on, referring to her as Juna-chan. Juna is noticeably taken aback, because Nana referred to her by her first name, and she refers to Nana with her last name, Daiba-san. That closeness and familiarity that these two built up during their time spent learning about one another and working on Starlight, it's gone. Because, as I'm sure the viewers have realized, and Nana will briefly, time has rewound back to the very start of production of Nana's precious Starlight. And so, Nana's cycle of her chosen stage of fate begins. Also, the animation is back to its usual bright colors and lighting, which makes sense, since this is Nana's most treasured time of her life that she has now gotten back, the dull gray of the future now gone. As Nana begins talking about her repeat performance of the 99th SciShow Festival, we get to see a montage of the various loops of her and everyone working together to put on the show. The montage is broken up with a shot of Nana's notebook which becomes more and more worn out every time we cut back to it, implying the sheer amount of times Nana has repeated this precious time of her life. This precious time where she fears nothing. No one has to leave SciShow, or grow up, or become an adult. In this seemingly endless time loop, not only is Nana happy, but she gets to protect everyone from suffering in the unknown future. And... I get that. I really do. I'm not saying you should trap your friends and loved ones in an endless time loop, but I do sometimes find myself looking back to my days in high school and missing the carefree and happy life I had, both with myself and the people around me. And I by no means have a tougher, difficult life. I'm still relatively young. I'm in an online film college program while working part-time. I still live with my parents, so I don't have to worry about things like rent yet. And I still have a pretty active social life with my friends, family, and coworkers. But now that I am 23 years old, I do find myself stressed and burnt out much more often than when I would be in high school, and the scariest thought I had after school was trying to decide which Sonic the Hedgehog game I wanted to play when I got home that day. And I worry a lot about my future. I like to think I'm heading to good places in life, and Review Starlight is always a good pick-me-up for when I'm feeling this way, but there's so much uncertainty and so much that could go wrong once I finish college. What if I can't afford to live on my own? What if I can't find a good place to live? What if I lose touch with my friends and family? What if I never succeed in any of my dreams and aspirations? What if I end up working a miserable, boring job that sucks the life out of me and leaves me with no energy to pursue my actual interests in my free time or live a meaningful life with those around me? These thoughts? They're scary and weigh me down. Even with all the encouragement and support I get from those around me or motivation I get from Review Starlight. So I'm not saying I would rewind time back to when I was younger so I would never have to face these things, but man, I miss the simpler times. And I do understand why Nana decided to do this repeat performance with her stage of fate. After some more loops and a scene where Nana probably creeps Karen out by predicting exactly what she was gonna say, we see Nana once again defeat Maya in the reviews and get confronted by the giraffe. Also, I just really quickly want to point out how beautiful the piano track that starts when Nana's talking about her repeat performances is. It's upbeat, but it has this unnerving, melancholic undertone to it. I feel like it repeats the same few different musical beats over and over again before switching to the next, 
which lines up really well with Nana talking about herself resetting time over and over again. After the giraffe congratulates her and asks her once more what stage she wishes for, Nana simply responds by saying that, It's still so blinding. The giraffe admits that not even he is sure how many times they have done this by now, and Nana asks why he's doing all this for her. The giraffe says that when a stage girl becomes a top star, their wonder and shine combines and produces an eternal sparkle, an eternal stage that no one can foresee. And he, he wants to see that stage. After all, you can't have a performer without an audience, can you? And that is why the seemingly omniscient and mysterious giraffe who watches over the Revu auditions shall continue to let Nana repeat her precious performance as much as she wants. That is, unless someone defeats her. As Nana thinks about what the giraffe just said, she hears a noise that isn't the same as the tiara falling down by her feet. Instead, it's a weapon we're all too familiar with planted into the Position Zero logo where the top star tiara should be. The soft piano music that had been playing up to this point also cuts off as soon as the noise is heard, signaling an upcoming change in Nana's status quo. With a look of surprise, Nana briefly looks in the distance to see none other than Hikari Kagura, before the screen cuts to black and time resets once more. Nana briefly wonders just who that was before we get a quick scene of her going throughout her time leading up to the review auditions as usual, with a light-hearted track playing in the background. Everything is back to how it should be. We eventually catch up to the first episode of the anime, where Karen falls out of her seat after dozing off and dreaming about being pushed off of Tokyo Tower. Once more, we see and hear the wheels of Hikari's suitcase, the same wheels that segued into the mechanical stage contraptions of Karen's dream from the first episode, and it is announced that Hikari will be joining their class, much to Nana's confusion. Real quickly before wrapping things up for this video, I just want to talk about how much I love the way this episode recontextualized the whole series. Somehow, I doubt most people were going into this series expecting a time loop of all things, but there were a couple hints to Nana's story and knowledge leading up to this episode. For starters, in the first episode, when it is first announced that there will be a transfer student joining their class, we do see Nana briefly have a look of confusion and surprise. Upon one's first viewing, one would probably assume that she just got caught off guard by the announcement of a transfer student. Which, I mean, is the case, but only because Nana should know exactly how everything leading up to the review auditions will play out. The perfect and preordained time of her life is being changed in front of her eyes. Another thing is in episode 5 where Mihiru overhears Nana talking to her fellow classmates about keeping the lead roles the same as they were in the last production of Starlight, Maya and Claudine. This odd interaction of Nana stubbornly wanting to keep things the same? Well, it makes a lot more sense when learning of her obsession with her past production of Starlight. There's probably more things throughout the series that I missed, but those are the two that came to my mind right away. Viewers, if there's anything I missed, please comment down below. And Otaku Box, if you can think of any hints or foreshadowing I missed, feel free to throw it on the screen. Oh, well, since I'm being summoned by name, in episode 3, when they're discussing the next performance of Starlight, it's revealed that Banana is not going to be on stage. And eventually, Maya makes a one-off line that Banana is best suited for this because she understands everyone so well and will be able to write the best script possible. With Banana responding that she'll make sure this will be the ultimate performance, just like our last Starlight. Referring to the one they've put on before, but of course, to her, all of the other loops. It may not be a direct foreshadow, but you can actually watch the show with the foreknowledge ahead of time and analyze each of her lines knowing what we now know. Anyway, this isn't my video, so back to you, Noah. I just love how we do get tiny bits of information and clues about this episode and its story before it actually happens. I'm not saying you can necessarily predict that the series has been taking place in a time loop up until it's start through these, but they do show a great level of care and detail in the crafting of this powerful and unique story. As Nana watches everyone, including Hikari, walk away from Saisho, she wonders what exactly happened to cause this change in her perfect timeline. She thinks to herself that maybe having the exact same stage every time is a little boring, but she stays determined that her repeat performance will not change. And as if talking to the viewers, or maybe the giraffe, or maybe the spectators to her stage of fate, Nana looks to the screen and says she wants Hikari on her stage as well. This scene is so cool. The red lighting makes the whole thing feel so ominous. And the way that Nana turns to the screen casting half her figure in a shadow, I mean it's so striking. It feels like we're seeing two sides to Nana. One excited and happy to have a new stage girl in her repeat performance, 
but then the other side feeling threatened by this change with the resolve to keep her stage of fate the way it is. It feels a little unhinged all in all, which I think describes a high schooler unhealthily repeating the same period of her life over and over again in fear of the future pretty well. Also, the music's really cool. It feels mysterious and exciting, and the way it cuts out right before Nana turns to the screen is so effective. As usual, we are treated to another version of Fly Me to the Star, but this time it's an instrumental version with visuals of Nana and the giraffe, which feels appropriate considering Nana's importance to the episode and what we've learned about the giraffe and the reviews. Being robbed of hearing the giraffe's beautiful singing voice aside, I do quite like this version of the ending. The instrumental track itself is very nice, and one cool detail about the ending's visuals before it cuts to the usual group shot is the amount of notebooks behind Nana and the giraffe. We can see a number of notebooks falling down behind them, representing the many times Nana had reset time as the top star. And after the group shot, instead of the usual visual of one or more of the stage girls in a spotlight, there lies Nana's notebook. A fitting way to end the episode so focused on the story of a girl longing for the past, and whose story is not quite over yet. As usual, thank you so much to everyone watching these videos. Please tell me down below in the comments of this video what you thought of my analysis or interpretation of Episode 7 of Revy Starlight. Is there anything I missed? Anything you disagree with? Or anything I mentioned in this video that you want to expand upon? I think I've made it very clear by this point, but I love talking about this beautiful series, and I would quite enjoy talking about it with everyone. This episode especially is such a huge turning point for the series and how it manages to have just as many impactful moments with its music, visuals, and storytelling, despite not having a review, is something truly amazing. It's honestly just one of my favorite anime episodes ever. And despite how lengthy this video may be and how much I rambled, I'm sure there are still some things I missed. With a series as dense and layered as Review Starlight, especially with episodes like this one, I'm sure there are some things that went over my head or that I just forgot to talk about. So please, let's have some fun Review Starlight discussions in the comments. In particular, one question I have for everyone is what did you think of introducing the element of time looping into the story? I can see for some how it might seem a bit out there, but I think it works very well for the story and Nana's character. And this is the same show with a talking giraffe who keeps saying I understand as he watches high schoolers fight, dance, and sing in an underground theater, so is time looping that weird? In all seriousness, Review Starlight is a series that makes use of its bizarre and unique premise to tell a very important and personal story. While outright saying that this is a show with time-looping theater girls and a talking giraffe sounds a bit crazy on its own, can't most people relate to missing the simpler days of their youth and fearing the uncertainty of the future? Every seemingly outlandish element or plot device has a very specific and important purpose within its narrative, and I think it all works wonderfully. And this is a show revolving around theater after all. Theater, which can be a very over-the-top and dramatic experience. And I'm not saying that in a bad way, that's something I love about theater. It's such a unique art form with its distinct brand of performance and storytelling. And I think Review Starlight embodies every aspect of what makes theater so great within its story as well. From its captivating music, to the performer's powerful acting, to the mesmerizing visuals, it all feels so right. It's a love letter to the art of theater, and one that succeeds in embodying everything that makes the art of theater so beautiful and endearing. I've heard some people say before that the visuals and what they represent in Review Starlight are too on the nose, but I really don't think that's the case. Every visual or stylistic choice not only serves the story and its themes wonderfully, but it's embodying the extraordinary and passionate visual imagery you'd find in theater productions. And just like how theater hosts a myriad of different and unique stories that resonate with people, so does every episode of Review Starlight. Each episode tells its own emotional and important story which all lead into each other and form the complete series that is Review Starlight, a love letter to theater, an in-depth look at both the beauty and hardships of pursuing creative or artistic passions, a mesmerizing and emotionally gripping story that all can enjoy. That is Review Starlight. Even if you're not passionate about theater such as myself or you can't personally relate to the themes and character struggles, there's still so much to take away from this unique and captivating series. But anyways, I've gone on long enough. I should stop myself before I start losing my mind about the fact that the Review Starlight visual novel is a month away from releasing and we still don't know much about the plot as of recording. As usual, thank you to OtakuBox for your great editing on these videos. A link to his channel can be found in the description, and I highly recommend checking out some of the cool content he has to offer on his channel, such as his most recent upload as of recording this, which is a video about Horamiya. I wouldn't be able to get these videos out at the pace I have been if it weren't for your quick and skilled editing work, and I really appreciate your help. 
One last time, thank you again to everyone for watching. Please consider subscribing if you want to see more Review Starlight and visual novel content from me. Thank you to those who are already subscribed and watching for your continued support, and I will see you all in the next video.